tonight we're going to be in two main passages as we continue our series in Genesis. Our first passage will be Genesis 25 verses 29 through 34 and from there we will then look at what the New Testament says about this and we will spend a lot of time in Hebrews 12 verses 5 through 17. So those are our two main passages uh, for tonight, so you can go ahead and mark them in your Bible. There will also be a very interesting text in Deuteronomy 29, verses 18 through 20. So if you want to bookmark those uh, three passages uh, in your Bible, those will be the texts that we uh, are interacting with tonight. Uh, Recently, as a wonderful gift from God to me, I have been turned on to a TV series called Alone. And in this TV series, as I've watched it, I have been fascinated by how strongly it parallels the Christian life. And the way the series goes is there are 10 survival experts who get dropped into very harsh climates and they have a contest to see who can last the longest. At any time they can quit, all they have to do is use their sat phone and tap out. And the last one standing wins $500,000. And as these people are in the wilderness, they have all sorts of trials. They have to build a sufficient shelter. They have to battle a harsh weather that can be deadly. They have to face issues of starvation, dehydration, and hypothermia. And in addition to this, there are many dangerous animals like bears and wolves and mountain lions and wolverines and all sorts of things that can kill them. And perhaps the greatest suffering that they endure is the reality of being completely alone. As you watch the episodes unfold, all of these things prevent great, or, or present great trials. But the most interesting one to me is the issue of loneliness. The loneliness causes some of these people, or all of them who last long enough, it eventually causes them to do some really deep soul searching. And they have to face who they are right in the mirror. And some of these contestants are nearly driven insane by the isolation. And in some of the promotional material, especially the one for season two, one of the contestants says that they all have to face the question of who are you when everything is stripped away? And so as the show unfolds, many of these contestants, they discover things about themselves that just horrify them and bring them to their knees and cause them to despair and cause them to give up. And some contestants find some positive things uh, that encourage them and they keep going. Well, in like manner, the Word of God tells us, I believe in various ways, in various contexts, and in various places, the Word of God tells us that the hardships of life, they will serve as a mirror to show us our true spiritual condition before God. When some people go through sufferings, they press into God, they hold on to promises, they live on His grace, and by the time it's all said and done, they become more holy through their suffering. When others go through hardships, they begin to feel sorry for themselves, they become worldly in their thinking, they run to sin, and they get their minds twisted. And whether they realize it or not, they begin to set themselves upon the path of apostasy. And so tonight we're going to return to the text of Genesis. And in our study, we're going to primarily be focused on the life of Esau. And as we watch his life unfold in the book of Genesis, and as we see what the New Testament says about him, we're going to discover that that for us to discern whether or not we're on the narrow path that leads to life, or if we're in danger of walking down the path of uh, apostasy, one of the ways we can assess that is by how we respond to hard things. And so Esau is a terrifying example of what it means to fall away from the faith, which is what it means to commit apostasy. And so I've titled this sermon, Esau's Guide to Apostasy. Now Esau's way into apostasy, it's not the only way. But if you follow Esau's way, it is a sure way to go there. And so uh, uh, go ahead and... uh, 
Uh, if you want, turn to Genesis 25. And as we approach our text tonight, I want to remind you of a few truths about Esau. We saw a few weeks ago that Esau, though he is a physical descendant of Abraham, he is spiritually the embodiment of the seed of the serpent. And by God's divine decree, Esau is not the elect of God, and he is therefore not a true child of Abraham, nor is he a true citizen of God's Israel. And when Esau was born, which is what we covered last time we were in the text of Genesis, Esau had a red cloak of hair that was covering him. And this red cloak of hair, it served as a prophetic symbol of his life of apostasy that's going to characterize who he truly is before God. And so tonight, we're going to see Esau's journey to apostasy, and uh, we're going to begin by reading about him selling his covenant birthright for a bowl of red stew. So let's begin in Genesis 25. And we will start in verses 29 and 30. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I'm exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. So here this text right off the bat clearly gives us the setting for Esau by telling us that he's going through a hard time. He's under a trial. And in this context, his trial is the trial of exhaustion and hunger. And as he approaches Jacob, he is longing to eat Jacob's red stew that he's preparing. And verse 30 goes out of its way to tell us that Esau is going to be named Edom, which means red. And he's going to gain this name in connection to what's going to happen in this story involving the red stew. And so at this point, in his exhaustion, in his severe hunger, there's nothing wrong at all with him asking his brother if he can eat some of the stew. He's not doing anything wrong. This is a trial for Esau. It's not easy being hungry. It drains your energy. And if you go a a, a couple of days without eating, your body will start to metabolize your fat and your muscles, and eventually it will even metabolize your vital organs. It will literally eat itself to death. So this trial is is difficult. Now, after asking Jacob for some stew, how does Jacob respond to his brother Esau? Let's look at verse 31. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Now, you may remember last time we were in Genesis, at Jacob's birth, his name was prophetic for how he was going to live his life. If you you recall from uh, the birth narrative, Jacob's name means deceiver or he cheats. And here, as he looks upon the need of his brother, he doesn't love him. He doesn't care about him. He doesn't try to minister to him. Instead, he seeks to take advantage of him. He seeks to cheat him. And so preying upon his brother's vulnerability, he offers him the red stew in exchange for Esau's birthright. Now Esau was the older brother. And according to Deuteronomy 21.17, as the older brother, Esau was entitled to a double portion of the inheritance of his father. And he was also to become the spiritual leader of the family. And as the leader of the family of Abraham's descendants, Esau would have been also the one through whom the Abrahamic covenant blessings would come to pass. So Jacob, in asking Esau to sell his birthright to him, he's not only pursuing the extra material wealth that will come with the double portion of the firstborn, but also he's pursuing the spiritual leadership of the family, and he's also trying to become the one through whom the covenant would advance. And so the essence here of Esau's temptation is to sell out God and his purposes for his life so that he can eat a bowl of red stew. Here's the idea. Put the things of this life above God. Put your own comfort above God. I think in essence, Esau's temptation, it might sound like this. Hey, Esau, you're hungry. Things are hard. So you know what? Go ahead and give into this. It's justified, Esau. You're having a hard time. So just 
put God beneath this red stew, sell your birthright and give in. I think that's the essence of the temptation. And so in this context, to put God first would require Esau to walk the difficult path of faithfulness. And this is the very path that's bringing him exhaustion and hunger. So to stay faithful to God here, he has to not immediately alleviate his hunger. But in order to sell out. All he's going to do to alleviate his suffering is just sacrifice the priority of God and give it to his brother. Put your comforts, put the love of the world above faithfulness to God. That's the temptation. And so let's read how the story ends. Verses 32 through 34. Nisah said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? And Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So here Esau is so focused on his hardship that he says in verse 32 that he's going to die. Now, Esau is not wrong to recognize that he's suffering. He's not even wrong to vocalize it. But I believe that what set into Esau was a sinful self-pity. And this self-pity began to lead him into justifying the sin of putting stew before God. And here's what I mean. When this pity party happens... What what, what happens in our hearts is we see suffering in our lives that's really there. We see hardships in our life that really are difficult. And so the way we respond is by feeling sorry for ourselves. We do it in a way that leads us to justify indulging sin. And here Esau, he's so aware of his hunger that he thinks he's going to die. And so in his mind, in the magnifying of his suffering, he became justified in selling his birthright for a single meal. And from this point forward, his life will will never be the same. Though he is descended of Abraham, though he knows the covenant promises, he has chosen to love red stew above God. He has left the faith and his life is now going to be nothing but a continual sinking into spiritual apostasy. He was covered in hair when he was born and his whole life is going to be covered in in putting the love of his sin and the love of the world above God. <clears throat> and so in Genesis twenty five thirty four, the last verse here of the text tells us, he ate and drank and rose and went his way. This phrase here, it's going to become a phrase that is associated with idolatry throughout the rest of the scriptures. Have you ever heard that saying before? They ate and drank and rose up to go his way or rose up to play. It's a very famous verse in the Bible. And it's found in Exodus 32, 6. And this statement is made after the golden calf episode. As soon as the golden calf episode took place, Exodus 32, 6 tells us that the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. It's the same exact thing that Esau did. This same idolatry. Later on in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 10, 7, it's a context where Paul is commending the church to turn from idolatry. And he quotes this same verse from Exodus 32, 6. Warning them not to be idolaters. Not to be like these people who ate and drank and rose up to play. And so this phrase about idolatry, it all has its roots in Esau's apostasy here. And so as the word of God uh, unfolds the remaining of Esau's life, his uh, apostasy, just like the hairy cloak he was born with, it covers everything he does. By the end of Genesis 26, we read that Esau forsook the people of God and he violated God's standards for marriage. 
God clearly reveals in Genesis 2, marriage, one man, one woman. What does Esau do? He marries two women. He's just like Lamech back in chapter 4 who embraces multiple wives. And not only does Esau embrace multiple wives and thereby violate God's standards, but also these two wives are Hittite women. These are women who are not among the covenant people of God. And so at the end of Genesis 26, just as he did with the stew, Esau put his desire to marry multiple wives and his desire to marry worldly women. He put that ahead of God's purposes. And by the end of chapter 26, chapter 26 tells us that these marriages made life bitter for his parents because they now have unbelievers as daughters-in-law. Esau is putting himself above God again. Later in chapter 27, Jacob and his mother conspire to deceive uh, Jacob and Esau's father, Isaac. Isaac is blind, and so they conspire to deceive him into laying hands on Jacob and passing the blessing on to him rather than Esau. And of course, years earlier, through Esau's own willful choice, he'd already sold the birthright to Jacob. But when we get to chapter 27, this is how it all unfolds. And we'll look at this more when we break down 26. Just this whole family is so dysfunctional. Uh, anyways, um, when uh, he finds out, uh, when Esau finds out that Isaac was deceived into giving this blessing to Jacob, Esau reacts in a way that is very entitled, very worldly, and is filled with grief, but it has zero repentance in it. I, the reason I believe Esau acts in a way that's very entitled is he thinks that this covenant blessing should be his. And he thinks this even though he had already made the willful decision to sell it for a bowl of stew. Nevertheless, he still thinks that it should belong to him. That's how entitled people act. And so when he finds out that, that Isaac can't now give him this blessing, he starts crying. And his crying is, he's not weeping over his sin and over offending God. He's weeping over losing out on the blessing. There isn't one whiff of true repentance here. He's just crying because he doesn't like the consequence. His sorrow here, it's, a, it's merely a sorrow over losing out on the blessing. There's no confession of sin. There's not any signs of repentance. Uh, and, and in fact, not only are those things lacking, but according to Genesis 27, 41, in his sorrow and weeping here, he becomes obsessed with murdering Jacob. And the reason why he does this is because Esau is Satan's seed. And as the seed of the serpent, Esau is filled with hostility towards the seed of the woman who is Jacob. And so by the time this has happened, listen, Esau's lived such a life of just being so comfortable with his sin that he's just so twisted. He knows something's wrong. He knows something's not, things aren't okay. He's able to even cry about it. But you know what he can't do? He can't assess the situation rightly. He can't own his own sin. He can't repent. He's not doing any of that because he's just so, he's been so twisted by a life that just eats and eats and eats at the table of sin and forsakes God. It has twisted this man. And now he wants to even murder his own brother, Jacob, the seed of the woman. He's an apostate through and through. And like all other people who are on the path to his apostasy, his heart is set on murdering the people of God. And so here's something we can learn from Esau. Set your heart on having your sin. If you set yourself to that, you can be guaranteed that one of the first fruits that this is going to bear in your life is that you're going to all of a sudden be hostile towards the people of God, which is exactly what happened to Esau. And all of these things that are taking place, it was all rooted in Esau feeling sorry for himself in a time of difficulty and using his hardships to justify his sin of selling out the priority of God to ease his suffering with a bowl of red stew. 
And as the New Testament considers this story, and as the New Testament interprets this story under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it does so by first exhorting us to think about hardships in a God-centered way unto holiness. And then after instructing God's people how to live in a godly way while we go through hardships, it then transitions into a warning to us about running to sin in our hardships. And its final warning is something we need to tremble at. We need to tremble at turning to sin in our suffering lest we become an Esau. So for the remainder of the sermon, we're going to look at a larger passage of the New Testament that is going to uh, break down hardships and how we're to respond to them. And it's going to be Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 17. So again, first part, here's how to think about hardships in your life and what God is doing and what His purposes are. So run to holiness. Second part, hey, if you run to sin, you'll become an Esau. That's, there it is. Sermon's over. Uh, at least the points are. Let's just break down the text and see if that stuff's there. Hebrews 12, 5. Let me give you a little bit of context. Uh, back in chapter 10, verses 32 through 39, we read that the members of this church have undergone tremendous hardships for their faith. These people have experienced social ostracism. They were publicly ridiculed. Their, po their property had been seized. And some had even been in prison for their faith. And so as a result... Feeling, feeling confused by all of this suffering, some of these people were tempted, like Esau, to turn away from God to alleviate their suffering. And so in the context of this church, the temptation was to commit apostasy by putting themselves back under the Mosaic law and relating to God through the Old Covenant. This would require that they forsake Christ that they, and that they turn from the gospel that's been, that has now inaugurated the new covenant. So the whole reason they're suffering is because they're following Jesus. You want to get rid of it? Okay, just turn from the gospel. Go back over here to old covenant Judaism. That would take care of their suffering. And so the author warns them against doing this at the end of chapter 10. And then in chapter 11, he tries to encourage these suffering saints by showing them from the Old Testament how so many people before him were also mistreated by the world when they walked the narrow path of faith. And then as chapter 12 begins, the author draws attention to the sufferings that Christ himself went through when he was on the earth. And he reminds us that Christ's sufferings included his public murder at the hands of sinners. And so what the author is trying to do is he is trying to encourage this church that their suffering is not the sign of God's abandonment of them. It's not a sign God has forgotten them. It's not a sign God has done with them. Instead, the author is going to labor to show them how the father is lovingly working in their lives for their holy good. The author is going to show us that God is a loving father towards his children who will discipline his children through hard things. And he's going to use these hard things to help his children become more holy. And when God does this, he's not rejecting his children. Instead, he is loving them. So real quick. Before diving in, I want to give one last little caveat. Not every single hardship that comes into our life is a result of our sin. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. We have passages that speak to both. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, all the way through 12, 10, Paul has these thorns that are weakening him. And he doesn't have them because he sinned. In fact, Jesus tells him he has them to prevent the sin of pride. And so there are things that came to Paul to weaken him, to keep him from becoming proud, and to let the sufficiency of his grace stand in Paul's life and the, and the power of God rest on Paul's weakness. Paul's not sinning. At the same time, in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty two, 32, we read about guys who go to the Lord's table and they get drunk. And they're just justified in their drunkenness at the table. So what does God do? Paul tells them, some of you are sick, some of you are weak, and some of you were even killed by God because of this. 
And he tells them that the reason God did this was to pre prevent them from becoming apostate and being condemned with the world. So that's a clear text that shows us you want to play with sin and you want to be unrepentant in it. God will go so far as to sometimes kill you to keep you from going apostate. So sometimes hard things in our life, they absolutely are God using them to chastise us in sin. And sometimes they are not. If it's a hard thing in your life that uh, God's using to chastise you because you're sin, you probably know that it is. And if you haven't done anything wrong and you're suffering, okay, the scripture speaks about that too. So, but regardless of what season you find yourself in, whether you're suffering consequences for your sin or you're just suffering, you don't know why you're suffering, there's hope for you. So, let's begin and look at this hope in verses 5 through 6. Here's what God's up to. Da, 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 da. Hebrews 12, verse 5 and 6. You have not, and you, you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. So in these two verses, the author reminds this church that in their hardships, they are still sons of God and God is treating them as his children, even though they're going through difficult things. And so he gives two exhortations in this verse. Uh, he exhorts them to avoid the two wrong responses to God's discipline through hardship in our lives. The first wrong response that will help you become an Esau is to regard the discipline of the Lord lightly. That's what he says. Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. So to do this, this is the professing Christian who's hardened about their sin. Maybe at some level, yeah, they know it's wrong. They might even with their lips admit it a little bit. But they are in this constant pattern of doing it anyways. And even though God might discipline them, it doesn't really do anything to them. And honestly, they don't really seem to care all that much about their sin. And then when God brings painful consequences into their lives to correct them, their attitude is to regard this discipline lightly. At the end of the day, no matter what their words say, you can tell they regard it lightly because they don't respond in holiness to the discipline of God. Just eh, blowing it off. Just like a kid who, Julie says sometimes, <clears throat> especially when the kids were littler, because of course, Livy and Nonos would never do this now, but especially when they were littler, they would be rebellious all day. And she would say, hey, knock it off, knock it off, knock it off. And then I would come home and they'd do the same thing. I'd be like, knock it off. They'd be like, okay. And uh, she would, she'd get frustrated. She's like, they just blow me off, you know, <laughs> during the day. It's an example of regarding discipline lightly. It's like a kid, clean your room, clean your room. <laughs> Four hours later, she having cleaned your room. That's regarding discipline lightly. And there are Christians who do that to God all the time. And it is the first wrong response to his discipline. And as the text keeps unfolding, it's a sure path to becoming an Esau. The second error, according to these two verses that you can make in responding to God's discipline, is to become weary when reproved by him. So notice he says, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. So this is a person who has kind of the exact opposite response, but a response is still worldly and wrong. This is the person who knows they sinned. They hate their sin. They feel God's discipline in their life. And rather than responding in repentance and trusting the cross, this person responds with despair and hopelessness. They are weary. They are so overcome with guilt, so drowned in sorrow that whether they admit it or not, they feel like their sin is bigger than God. They feel like God is done with them and they might even start to believe that God hates them. And so when you are this type of person, 
It, this kind of response, it sucks away all of your life and vigor and spiritual strength. It makes you sluggish. It makes you hopeless about the work of God in your life. And you can become so exasperated and discouraged that eventually you give up on this, uh, that you will eventually you'll give up on the faith if that response is left unchecked. This, too, is a path to becoming an Esau. This is the path of the perfectionist. And this is the one whose true joy, it's not the joy of Christ saving him from his sins, but it's the joy of his own glory and perfection. And so when he sees the reality of his sin is obvious to himself and he can't deny it. And when the discipline of the Lord is, behind, is upon him, he can't rejoice in the gospel and the grace of God and repent and trust promises. Instead, he despairs that he's not as good as he thought he was. And he ends up feeling sorry for himself himself and he quits and oh it's hopeless I'm so horrible and then he uses that as the excuse to continue in sin and it goes right on the path of being an Esau those are the two wrong responses to the discipline of God but for the true child of God though there may be times he initially regards God's discipline lightly Though there may be times that he initially responds in despair and hopelessness when God disciplines him. And though he may sin bitch for a moment, eventually he comes to his senses. He, a right mind is renewed in him and he freshly places his hope in the truth of verse 6. Namely, that God disciplines the one he loves and the one whom he considers a son. And when he does this, whether he was blowing off God's discipline or whether he was overly discouraged by it, he eventually responds to it by growing in holiness. It's called repentance. I don't know about you, but I've responded both ways wrongly uh, in my walk before. Now let's look at verse 7. It's for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father doesn't discipline? Verse 7 tells us that we have to keep enduring in the faith in a holy way when God disciplines us because this is how God raises his children. Listen, it is the worldly parent who allows their children to be unruly and insubordinate. It is the worldly parent who so hovers over and micromanages every little detail of their kid's life that they crush their spirit and leave them embittered and leave them miserable. God doesn't do either of these things. God treats us as children, meaning he will not let our sin go unchecked and he will discipline us so that we don't become the unruly son. And at the same time, the purposes behind his discipline, it's not just to crush and destroy us, it's to build us so that when we are disciplined, we have hope and we're not the exasperated corpse that is hopeless and despairing. This is what God does with his discipline. This is how he parents his children. And the implication of verse 7 is that God is good when he does this. Now, to prove God's goodness in discipline, the author is now going to compare him to earthly parents in verses 8 through 10. If you're left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. Now, I can't cover all of this stuff for time's sake, but a couple of highlights here. Here, I think the comparison's pretty simple. The author reminds us that earthly parents who are sinners who imperfectly discipline their kids, eventually, and this is of course a general truth, eventually those parents are respected by their kids. On the other hand, when kids have parents uh, who, uh, um, <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, on the other hand, kids might uh, you know, like to hang out with the parent who never disciplines them. 
But at the end, generally speaking, as adults especially, kids never respect that. They might like you in the moment, but you will not have their respect. On the other hand, when, kid have, when a kid has parents who will discipline them, imperfect as it may be, it leads to the respect of the children. And so the point is, if we show respect to imperfect fathers who discipline us imperfectly, how much more should we submit to God's discipline and find hope and encouragement in it? God is a better father than any earthly parent. And if you can find any measure of respect and encouragement towards an earthly parent's discipline in your life, how much more should you find that when your heavenly father brings discipline into your life for his loving purposes? Don't regard this lightly and don't lose heart. But instead, when you're being disciplined by God, you have to trust in a forgiving father that loves you so much that he's willing to discipline you. Now, as we move forward and we look at verses 10 and 11, there are two promises about God's discipline in verses 10 and 11. We'll begin with verse 10 and read uh, the first promise of verse 10. For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But here's the promise. God disciplines us for our good. So that's a promise. His discipline towards us is for our good. And what's the specific good? He disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. That's the promise. According to verse 10, the reason God disciplines us is for the good of us sharing in his holiness. Now, all of God's discipline, every single thing about it, it has the holiness of his children as the goal. And if you keep reading in Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, 14, a few verses later, it will give you a reason why holiness is such a blessed thing. Let's read verse 14. Listen to the blessedness of holiness. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. No holiness, you can't see the Lord. What's the opposite of that? With holiness, you see the Lord. Seeing the Lord is what's at stake here. That makes holiness a pretty precious thing. Now, he says in verse 14, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. What does he mean by that? Does he mean that unholy Christians will fail to see God in their own lives because they're so blinded by unrepentant sin? Or does it mean that other people will not see God in their lives because his light is being dimmed by the hypocrisy of the unrepentant? Which one does it mean? I don't know, but I know both are true. I lean towards if you walk in unholiness, your spiritual senses are so darkened that you can't see God work in your own life. You're not able to perceive it. Let me unpack this a little more. And there, there's a reason I, I, I believe this. Matthew 5, 8, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. Because why? They will see God. You want to see God? A pure heart is what is essential to being able to see God. Let me flesh out what I mean by this, what I, what I think the author is getting at. When we're walking in the Spirit, when we're repenting of sin, when we're walking in obedience, when there's a purity of heart in our lives that enables us uh, to see or, or sense God, when we're walking this way, our spiritual senses are greatly heightened. The word of God is glorious and every sentence that we read, it's rich and every word seems to feed our soul and mediate the presence of Jesus to us. When we walk out into the world and we're walking with a pure heart, our sense of fellowship with the spirit is heightened. And when we see things take place, we can assess them well and we have the mind of Christ and the spirits flowing in us and we have sweet worship and there seems to be a sense of God everywhere. We are very tuned into his presence. 
And when we are walking in purity, our prayers are sweet and we long to praise God. Have you ever, have you ever just had, don't you love those times where you're just like, man, i got to go just get away and praise God, right? But don't you, I love it when you're feeling that way. And so we long to praise God and we hunger to have fellowship with His people and we love the law so we're zealous for good works. We see God when we're walking this way. But when we give ourselves to sin and when sin takes root in our heart and we walk in unrepentance and a stubborn worldly mindedness takes over, our spiritual senses become greatly dulled. We can no longer sense a sweet fellowship with God. We go to the word and it seems like we get nothing out of it. You ever read the Bible and it feels like a sealed book to you? Sometimes it's because of harbored sin. There are other reasons, not always a sin. But sometimes it's because I guarantee you're harboring sin, that's going to happen to you. Sometimes we hear praise songs and uh, when our heart is tainted and corrupted, praising God feels like a distant memory. And then as we go through the issues of life, we're swirling with confusion and we don't know how to assess anything. And rather than a sense of the sweetness and presence of God that seems to drip off of all we see when we're walking in purity, we feel in, in place of that, we feel shut out from God. And we are lost as to how to connect with Him again. And instead of wanting fellowship with the saints, we, became, we start nitpicking and gnat straining and finding everything wrong with them. And we want to avoid them. And we harbor evil suspicions. And we isolate ourselves. This is what happens when we let sin take root in our heart. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 calls it quenching the spirit. And so without what? Holiness, nobody will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. What do the prophets say? Can two walk together unless they agree? The pleasures of God and the pleasures of sin, they don't mix together. You will never have a vibrant, sweet walk with Jesus when you allow your heart to be gripped and polluted by sin. Never. So God promises His discipline is to produce holiness in us. And the reason holiness is valuable is because it enables us to see God. And if it means the opposite, or if it means the other meaning, where holiness in our life enables others to see God in our life, well, that's true too. Holiness is good, right? We want people to be able to see God in our lives. But when we walk and are shrouded in the darkness of cherished sin, nobody sees God in our lives. Instead, we become reeking blemishes. And we don't represent the Lord. Now, the next promise about discipline, it's found in verse 11. And this promise is a conditional promise, meaning the only way it's going to happen is if you do your part. Here's verse 11. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So I'm thankful for verse 11's acknowledgement that discipline is not fun. It isn't. I don't like it. You don't like it. It's not pleasant. It's painful. But there's something good here. In his discipline, it says God is laboring to produce the peaceful fruits of righteousness in your life. And so when you respond to his discipline with holiness, when you respond with repentance, then you're going to find peace. And it's an inner, it's these peaceful fruits of righteousness. Responding in holiness brings this peaceful fruit. And it's an inner peace with God. It's the peace of mind of knowing that you're walking in his will and you're no longer walking in hostility towards him or towards his people. But according to this text, the only way this promise is going to manifest itself to God's children is if they are trained by the discipline. Notice the end of this wording there. 
It produces the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who are trained by it. So, you have to do your part here. You have to respond to, in holiness to God's discipline. And if you do not respond in holiness to his discipline, then you will not share in the blessings of this discipline and you will not have the peaceful fruits of righteousness and you'll become an Esau. But if you just trust him, if you hope in his steadfast love, and if you fear him in the sense that you fear taking one more step away from him, away from God and towards his apostasy, I want to turn around and take steps towards you. And if you hope in your discipline, if you hope in God's goodness and you trust, even if you've blown it, that he'll forgive you and he'll wash you. If you turn in holiness to God, he will produce peaceful, righteous fruit in your life. One of the universal characteristics of a Christian walking in sin without exception is that they have absolutely no peace. No real Christian who's walking in sin has peace. Fake Christians might. It's a false peace from the devil that'll send them to hell. But real Christians have no peace when they're walking in sin. So here with the discipline of God, if you want peace, peaceful fruits of righteousness, you've got to let the discipline train you unto holiness. Ignore it and you're not going to have peace. God's children will be trained by his discipline, but the Esau's will not. <clears throat> so by the end of this discipline process, verse 12 through 13 shows us how the child of God is to respond. He stopped regarding the discipline lightly or he stopped being overly discouraged by it. He recognized the goodness of God in it. Okay, let me get in line with what you're doing. Let this discipline train me and make me holy. What's the result? Verse 12 and 13. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. So here's where it goes. Get up. God's for you. He doesn't hate you. Just repent and God's good with you. And you got peaceful fruit and you can walk again. Stop letting sin cripple you. Stop letting discouragement cripple you. Respond to the discipline in holiness. Trust God's loving heart. Don't blow off his discipline anymore. Let it train you. And as it does, hey, God's for you. You're his child. So strengthen your weak knees and get up and walk in a straight path, having been healed by the loving discipline of your father. There is hope in the discipline of God if we respond to it. And so all that's going to happen is you just move on in joy and peace. But if you don't want that, if you don't want to respond to it, you're going to end up in verses 15 through 17, which is where nobody wants to be. Verse 16 and 17, we're going to see, our, our, we're going to see the homie Esau again. You don't want to be in verses 15 through 17. So I hope verses 12 through 14 made it clear, or verses 5 through 14 made it clear, this is what we do with our hard things and the discipline of God. And if you don't, we go to verses 15 and 17. So let's... Close with that. We're going to close with a warning. So the goodness of God and the promise there, you had your comfort. Now we're going to get scary, okay? Verse 15. There's the warnings of what happens to people who don't respond to discipline with holiness. Start at verse 15. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled. So the first description here and the first exhortation is see to it that no one fails to obtain God's grace. That's huge. Failing, to, and, and here's what it is, failing to respond to God's discipline with repentance and holiness, it's going to lead to a life that, is, that fails to obtain the grace of salvation because you become an apostate. That's what it means. And that'll be very clear by the end of verses 16 and 17. 
Don't fail to obtain the grace of God. Repent when you're being disciplined. If you don't, you will fail to obtain it. And so from here in this text, his first specific warning about failing to receive God's grace is the command that no root of bitterness should be allowed in the church because it will defile many. What does that mean? Most people think it's someone who's bitter at somebody else and they get mad at them and that defiles everything. I used to believe that till Friday. And certainly that's a bad thing. We don't want that either. Uh, that, that, that view, that's a bad thing. But you will notice if you're reading the ESV that there are quotation marks around the phrase root of bitterness. Why is that? The reason why is because the translators of the ESV, but I, I, th- I, I think rightly, they believe that this statement is a quotation of Deuteronomy 29.18. And so when I studied this, when I looked at Deuteronomy 29 verses 18 through 20, and I looked at Hebrews 12 verses 15 through 17 and considered the context, it fits perfectly to quote Deuteronomy 29, 18 here. And so let's go ahead and read Deuteronomy 29 verses 18 through 20. Here, Moses, God through Moses is addressing his covenant people. And listen, if you think like this sounds like any of the apostasy stuff that's going to be going on in chapter 12. Deuteronomy 29, 18 through 20. Beware, lest there be among you a man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Beware, lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. One who, when he hears the word of this sworn covenant, he blesses himself in his heart saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. This will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry alike. The Lord will not be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that man. And the curses written in this book will settle upon him and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. Ouch! I think that's exactly what's being quoted in this passage here. So let's think about what we just read here in Deuteronomy 29. This passage warns against those who are going to turn away from God to follow the stubbornness of their heart to serve other gods. Or to serve sin. This same deceived man who's going to do this. According to verse 19, this guy thinks God is fine with him when he does this. Oh, God is good. I'll just sacrifice an animal tomorrow. Oh, it's all under the blood. Oh, this. if God's okay with this, they regard it what? Lightly. And in the end, according to verse 20, such a one will find no forgiveness. They will find swift judgment if they stay following the stubbornness of their heart without repentance. And so in Deuteronomy 28 verses or 29 verses 18 through 20, this deceived apostate, he is the bitter root. And left unchecked, this bitter root, he'll spread the fruits of apostasy unto the defiling of the nation. And it's the warning against apostasy, which is exactly what's being dealt with in Hebrews 12. And so when the text says, let there be no bitter root among you, it's not talking about don't be bitter at other people, though don't, that's a bad thing. It's talking about don't allow someone among you who stubbornly walks in the unrepentance of sin because it's going to lead to the defiling of many. Many other people will watch this false example of Christianity and follow in the path of apostasy. That's what it's talking about. The bitter root is the unrepentant, stubborn person who thinks everything's fine in their sin, who is going to eventually lead other professing believers into apostasy. That's the bitter root. Don't allow that to remain among you, Paul says. Or whoever the author of Hebrews is. I've been preaching Paul for five years, so I'm used to quoting that. The author of Hebrews says that. So, 
The bitter root, he's a professing believer who will not respond to God's discipline and holiness, and he's on his way to becoming an Esau. And now verses 16 and 17, here's what we'll close with. Now verses 16 and 17 brings the conversation right into the life of Esau. So verse 16 to, continues to elaborate along these lines by saying, uh, verse 16, oh, whoops, there we go. Verse 16. We're also to see to it, according to verse 16, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. Let's start, stop here. So the next thing in the text that we're to avoid being is sexually immoral like Esau. So here's the question. How is Esau sexually immoral? There are tons of theories on this that draw on extra biblical sources And there may be some truth to it, but you guys know me, I'm not crazy about that kind of stuff. So I'm I'm asking of the word, how is Esau sexually immoral? And there could be multiple answers to this, but I see at least two. First, I think Esau is sexually immoral in that he took two wives, which clearly violates God's plan for marriage that's revealed in Genesis 2. Second, these women were unbelievers. They were not the people of God. And so as you enter into the marriage relationship, obviously that relationship is consummated sexually. And so marrying unbelievers is is something that is wrong, that's immoral. He takes too many wives for one, and then he takes wives who are unbelievers. I think this is sexual immorality in a sense. Marrying unbelievers, it is a constant theme of sin and it is a sure path to to apostasy that's revealed in the scriptures over and over and over again. Read the Old Testament. One of the key things that leads Israel into apostasy over and over and over again is marrying from among the nations over and over and over again. This whole context is warning against apostasy. What did Esau do? He's an apostate who married unbelievers. So don't be like that. Perhaps it's talking about extra, uh, um, extramarital sexual relationships, which he clearly mentions in chapter 13 uh, as sin. But I think it also includes do not bring yourself into a marital union with unbelievers. It's a sure path to apostasy. And so Esau, just as he did with the bowl of stew, he put his lust ahead of the purpose of God. And he indulged in immorality by marrying, taking multiple wives and then taking unbelieving wives. And Esau never walks in repentance. And so after Esau sold his birthright, he just kept going and going and going. He kept giving in to sin and giving in to sin and giving in to sin and hardening himself and hardening himself. And he plays with sin and he plays with temptation and he plays with the love of the world. And now it has impacted his marriages and it had never stopped. And ultimately it leads him to the very last thing said about him in the New Testament. Which we're going to see in a minute in verse 17. Before we get to verse 17, verse 16 gives us one more little exhortation. Verse 16 says, see that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who for a single meal despised his birthright. And so now we hear that not only are we to avoid sexual immorality, but we're to avoid unholiness. And the unholiness is defined by the fact that he sold his birthright for a single meal. It was an act of apostasy. And so I love how John Piper described what Esau did here. Here's Piper's description. Esau looked straight down the path that leads to life and he saw adversity and hunger. And instead of believing God was in it, and instead of believing that he was working for his good as a loving and disciplining father, he sold it for a single meal and left the race. I love how that's worded. He saw the path of adversity and hunger. And instead of responding to this discipline of hunger by trusting God as his father, instead of responding in holiness, instead of letting hunger train him to produce peaceful fruits of righteousness in his life, instead of trusting he was a beloved son of God in his hardships, he left his hardships and, 
and he, or I'm sorry, he let his hardship justify his sin and it led to apostasy. And it led to increasing ungodliness whereby he is almost made insane according to verse 17. Let's read it. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he had no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. After selling the birthright, he later desired to inherit it after Isaac already gave it to Jacob. That's what I was talking about earlier in the sermon. And when, the, when all of this stuff came crashing upon him, though he sought the, to change this outcome with tears, he wasn't able to change it. And he was so far gone in his sin that he could no longer repent. That is terrifying. Listen, when we don't respond to hardships with trust in our loving Father, when we don't respond to uh, His discipline with hope in His good and loving purposes in the discipline, and when uh, um, we don't respond by allowing ourselves to be trained in holiness, eventually what will happen is we become so far gone in our sin that we are insane and we can't even repent anymore. Romans 1 talks about being handed over. Keep rebelling against God's discipline. Keep regarding it lightly. Keep uh, being so discouraged by it that you never repent. Keep doing that and He will eventually hand you over to your sin and you won't be able to repent. This is a terrible reality. And when we get handed over, like Esau, we can still cry about the hard things associated with sin. We can cry over the consequences. We can cry over the hardships. We can cry over things not going our way. But when we do this and we're handed over and we're not repentant, we're just merely shedding Judas tears of self-pity rather than Peter's tears of repentance. There's a sorrow in those who've been handed over to sin. They still have a sorrow about this sinful situation. But the sorrow is a worldly sorrow that leads to death. It's not a godly sorrow that leads to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7.10 Don't be deceived by thinking if you can cry about a sinful situation, the sign of the Christian is that you hate, your, that you hate sin and it's okay. no, no. no. There's a very much a worldly sorrow. There are Judas tears. There are Esau tears. And how do you know if it's worldly sorrow or if it's godly sorrow? Answer is simple. Does it lead to, do the tears lead you to repentance or not? If the answer is no, they don't lead you to repentance. It's worldly sorrow. And so when we are handed over to our sin, our minds become insane with self-centeredness. And we can engage some sinful situation that we know something's wrong, but all of a sudden we can't really diagnose the true problem and we can't find a path to repentance. We're so twisted and destroyed and demonic that we can't even turn to God anymore and we are under judgment. And I would remind you, this warning is being written to professing believers. He's not writing to the Buddhists, you know, when he writes this. He is writing this to professing believers. Esau was a child of Abraham. He wasn't an Anasazi Native American pagan. He was a child of Abraham. So the interesting thing about a pie, I, I, I don't know if we can know. How do, how do you know when you've become one of these people? I don't know. I really don't know. But the Bible warns us that this exists. And God's real people are going to fear God and be like, whoa, I don't even want to touch that. And you're going to stop playing with how close can I dabble in sin and toe the line. And you're going to run far from it if you're a child of God.
I've known a few people that I think are this, but I don't know. We won't know till the end. But I've met a few people that are like this. They could cry like that. But you know what they couldn't do? They could never repent. And here's one of the interesting things about apostates. The interesting thing about apostates is that when they're on the path of apostasy, they don't think they're on that path. They are exactly like the man in Deuteronomy 28, 19. The man who's described as the bitter root. He thinks, go read verse 19. What does he think about himself? He thinks he's fine. Judas thought he was fine. Esau was entitled and full of self and thought he should still receive the birthright that he willingly sold out. And then later he's so justified in that he sought to murder Jacob. That's how crazy he was. So listen, if you're playing with sin, if you're refusing to repent, if you are walking in the habit of using your hardships as excuses to turn to sin, I want to warn you in love that you are playing with the dangerous path of apostasy, even if you don't think you are. an intense text here tonight. And here's one way I want to help you discern some things. I want to try to rescue you if you're like me, kind of stag stammering at the power of this passage. Don't take the teeth out of it. Tremble. It's good to fear God. It's good to tremble at God. But let me try to help you if Maybe you're starting to feel hopeless. Here's how I want to help you. If there is any tug in your heart right now about anything God is pressing you to repent for, it's not too late. Repent quickly. Repent while you still can. Don't go so far down the path of apostasy that like Esau, you can't come back. So there's anything in you and you know what it is that wants to repent to God, do it. It isn't too late. And fear not doing it greatly. Listen, God's a loving God. He's a forgiving God. He wants you to be trained by his discipline. He wants you to stop blowing off his discipline if that's what you're doing. Or if you're letting his discipline discourage you so badly that you hide from him and use that to justify sin binges. He wants you to stop doing that too. He wants you to turn to him. He wants you to trust that he loves you. Trust that he'll forgive you. Trust that he'll work holiness in you. And, uh, but you have to turn in repentance. These are conditional realities. Do not be a second soil hearer who lets hardships choke the word in you unto apostasy. Instead, trust God, turn to him, repent and live. Listen, Jesus suffered and died to save his people from their sins so that when we go through hard things, the same hard things he went through, we might grow more and more in suffering in a holy way. He didn't die for us so that we can use our suffering to justify becoming an Esau. He died for us so that we would look to his sufferings for salvation and we would look to him as the example and we will walk the path of sanctification in our suffering to grow continually in holiness and Christ likeness as we go through hard things. So trust God, he loves you, and he will work wonderful things in your hardships if you will just let yourself be trained by him. So, I know there's a lot in that text tonight. Does anybody have any questions about this? I know it's kind of a, it can be a tricky topic. So if you have a question, feel free to ask. It's okay. Tatiana. Um, I have a question about Esau and his wives. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's good either. So, but there's a difference. One, there's one difference. So you're talking about the multiplicity of wives or everything surrounding it? Well, just how that was like a sign of how, yeah. like, like basically what was coming from okay. uh -huh. like How was that different with Jacob? Than Jacob. Yeah. 
Great question. There's one key difference. So there's one. There's a point of correspondence, right? Point of correspondence: multiple wives. God has shown us in Genesis two His design. First place, multiple wives manifests itself as with Lamech in Genesis four, who is a disaster, train wreck, evil guy. Okay, Esau does it. Jacob does it. I don't think he's right when Jacob does it either. Jacob is not exactly the most uh, imitable guy in the Word of God. But here's the difference. Jacob takes wives from Laban. Do you remember who Laban is related to? Sarah. He comes from the Shemites. He's part of the blessed people of God. He is taking wives from among the people of God. Esau is taking wives from among the pagans, from among the Hittites. So that is one key difference between uh, their marriages is Jacob's has problems. I'm not trying to say it doesn't, but he's taking people from the people of God. Whereas Esau, everything the dude does marks him out as the seed of the serpent. So he's marrying foreign wives. It says that he's a skilled hunter. You know who else is a skilled hunter? Ishmael. Uh, Ishmael married Egyptians. Jacob marries Hittites. Ishmael persecuted Isaac. Uh, I said Jacob marries Hittites. I meant Esau. Uh, Ishmael persecutes Isaac. Esau persecutes Jacob, wants to kill him, all these stuff. So it's a good question. I would say that's the key point of non-correspondence there, though. So, uh, anyways, Joe? Yeah. What about Solomon? He, he married Bathsheba, and after that, he started marrying multiple wives. He was a man of God. So well, actually, David married Bathsheba. Oh, okay. Yeah. She's Solomon's mom. So that didn't go well for David either. And also, with, uh, uh, sorry, finish your question. No, that was, uh, okay, so that's on Solomon Mary. Yeah, and so near the end, right. right? Yep, and so near the end of, so first of all, Deuteronomy in the law, and I don't have a specific passage in my mind, I can uh, Google search it. Deuteronomy gives commandments for the king. It knows a king is coming. And it commands that the king is not to multiply wives. It's a straight up commandment about Israel's future kings. And Solomon does this. And uh, at the end of Solomon's life, what does the word of God say? It says these wives turned his heart from the Lord. And he starts building shrines to false gods and all this stuff. They turned him away from God. So this isn't, uh, this isn't a good thing. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, you know, aware of aware of that. Maybe it's been a little bit since I read that. Oh. But Matt, I think you're right about the difference between Jacob and Esau, um, <clears throat> because Jacob had two wives, Esau had multiple wives. It was bad in both cases. It caused a lot of trouble in both cases. Mm-hmm. It was never the ideal, but that's not what's in view when mm-hmm. Esau is in sin. It says. He, when he saw that the Canaanite women didn't please his parents, he went and married. In addition to his wives, he already had multiple wives. Mm-hmm. He went and married a Canaanite woman. It was it was outright rebellion yeah. against his yep. father. It wasn't yep. like Jacob got tricked into having two wives. It wasn't great. It, yeah, he up that's it true. Really yeah, good, but it wasn't rebellion against God's yeah. plan. It, you know, Jacob's was wrong closer to a yeah. mistake Esau's yeah. was I'm done just with this. in your I'm face not try to please my family yeah I'm not gonna try to please God yep he's just that's a good I think signal of when he's just completely on his own exactly no yeah. view of what's right there yeah that's a good point there and what is one of the key characteristics of the seed of the serpent they're hostile towards the seed of the woman he is totally hostile towards this the covenant matriarch and patriarch Isaac and Rebecca and bang this is you don't want me to marry her? All right. Come on, baby. Uh, that's uh, kind of that in-your-face sort of thing. Uh, uh, good question. Anyone else? Okay, so maybe one question, pop quiz. It's real easy. How do you know if you're an Esau or not? Every child of God has sin. Every child of God is going to be disciplined by God. How do you know if you're a child or an Esau? What's the distinguishing mark? What'd you say? <laughs> Repentance. Bang. Mom. Boom. Got it. That's it. It's that easy. So, anyways, um, 
Someone who says, I prayed and asked Jesus into my heart. He doesn't care how I live. That just doesn't square at all with the New Testament. You can believe that lie. You can misapply the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith alone that way. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to hell if you do it that way. So, here it is. Um, That's Esau. I actually think it's incredibly uplifting, but I'm weird... (laughs) I, 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 I'm weird like that, I guess. So, any other questions or comments anyone has? Yeah. Joe? One comment. You know, I've heard people say, well, I'm born again, and, you know, I know I'm going to sin, so I don't worry about it because I know God will forgive me. Yeah. That sounds like more like an Esau. Ah, for sure. Day. Yep, that is a straight up Esau. And if they don't come out of that mindset and that view and repent, they're going to end up like Esau. Yeah. So, anyways, anyone else? Okay, let's pray and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you, God, for this fascinating, terrifying, and I believe hopeful story about Esau and all that you've said about it. God, we just tremble before you. God, we do have sins, and I pray you would bring our, help us to bring our sins to Jesus and turn from them. And God, you know, we all go through hard things and we go through different things at different times. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to not take hard things in our life and use it as an excuse to indulge our sins. But rather, we would take these hard things in life, know you're disciplining us for holiness, and we'd use them as opportunities and springboards to get even closer to you and to repent more deeply and more thoroughly because we're your beloved children, knowing that you are just refining away dross. God, we, we pray you'd help us live with that mindset. Help us to have the violent mindset of murdering every single sin that we know of in our hearts and in our minds. God, help us walk in peace, the peaceful fruits. Help us be trained by your discipline so that we have peace with you and peace with your people, Lord God. We ask that you would please work this in our life. Help us not waste our hardships. Help us not waste our discipline by failing to respond to it, God. And we, we know this is a work of grace, yet this work of grace triggers a response to uh, from us. So help us respond well. Work within us that which is pleasing in your sight. Lord, we love you and we praise you, God, for the truths of your discipline. We praise you for the warning about Esau. God, may nobody in this church be found to be an Esau, Lord. We love you and pray in Jesus' name. 